Coming up on Market to Market. The federal government releases a fish into the food system and catches a mixed reaction. And we'll roam the plains on a farmer's quest to revive an icon of the Old West. Those stories and market analysis with Elaine Cub and Walt Hackney next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, November 20 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The price of food, gasoline, and shelter all rose last month, a sign consumer inflation may be rising. According to the Labor Department, the Consumer Price Index rose two-tenths of a percent in October. Core CPI, where factors causing the most volatility are stripped out, increased at the same rate. New housing starts struggled last month, declining 2.4 percent. Oil traded below the $40 threshold early in the week for the first time since August, with the energy commodity finishing barely above the line on Friday. And just in time for Thanksgiving travel, some drivers can fill up for less than $2 a gallon. However, AAA says the average price for that gallon is $2.11. One of the discussions during the Thanksgiving holiday will likely include the terrorist attacks in France. The world economy remained ambivalent to last weekend's assault in Paris. And Syrians seeking refuge following atrocities in their homeland sparked mixed reaction. In the U.S., more than 30 states said no thank you to the immigrants. And for some countries, the drain on basic resources like food was too much for them to bear. While the effect of new arrivals are on the forefront, a shift in how certain foods are created and distributed took place this week. The science of altering the genetic makeup of plants is an old one. But giving the green light to the marketing of genetically modified animals is a new one. The FDA made history this week, approving genetically modified salmon for human consumption. The Food and Drug Administration's move clears the way for the Aqua Advantage salmon, a fast-growing fish that will be raised in land-based farms and put into U.S. grocery store shelves. The CEO of the Massachusetts-based Aqua Bounty says this is a game changer because the salmon grow twice as fast as traditional animals and is done so in an environmentally responsible manner. The GM fish will not need to be labeled as engineered because there are no material differences between the Aqua Advantage strain and naturally raised salmon. Once the product reaches supermarkets, consumers may not realize they are consuming a fish from the new line, as flavor, texture, and color are the same. Critics are calling the modified salmon a frankenfish, and some members of Congress are pushing back against the approval, citing health, labeling, and economic factors. In the days before plows broke the plains, the prairies were populated with different animals that helped sustain Native American life. Stories are still told about the open prairie being made black with enormous herds of bison. By the late 1800s, commercial hunting decimated the bovine species. Naturalists brought the herd back from the edge of extinction. And over the past few decades, several entrepreneurs have been working to increase the herd size and round up some profit. Josh Bittner explains. It's been said that good fences make good neighbors. But for one Nebraskan, these fortifications are a gateway to his vision of restoring magnificence to the Great Plains. The bull, especially the bulls, you know, this is, they're so majestic. The way they walk, they just kind of, you know they're the boss. And uh, they're just kind of the king of the prairie like the lion is the king of the jungle, you know. Watertown Bison Ranch in Amherst, Nebraska is where Dave Klingelhofer and his family house 150 head of bovine behemoths which can stand six feet tall and weigh up to a ton. We were going to buy two calves, one for each grandson, and we came home with 11. So we, I guess we got in it that way. 
Klingelhofer grew up with 11 siblings on a farm just five miles away, raising hogs, cattle, and farming row crops most of his life. And his own corn and soybean operation has afforded the opportunity to sow a few hundred acres with seeds from the past. Yeah, ever since I was a little kid, I've been fascinated with the Wild West. In uh, fourth grade, American history, we did a lot of stuff with bison and Indians, and I always liked that. Estimated at a herd size of 30 to 60 million in North America in the year 1600, bison, bison, or buffalo, as they're known somewhat interchangeably, were hunted to near extinction over a century ago. According to figures from the National Bison Association, by 1900, the American buffalo population had dwindled to less than 1,000 head. But conservation efforts have resulted in a rebound of sorts. Industry trade groups claim 20,000 bison now roam public lands in the U.S. and Canada. And while far short of a stampede comparatively, USDA's 2012 Census of Agriculture adds over 160,000 bison, valued at nearly $95 million, on more than 2,500 private farms and ranches on domestic soil. Government numbers indicate less than 100 private buffalo herds exist in the Cornhusker state. But the modest resurgence has served up niche markets for Watertown Bison Ranch, starting in nearby Kearney. You know, he kind of approached us and said, hey, listen, we have this bison. We'd like to kind of see how it would work on your menu. And, and so we've, we've introduced it as a special item, and it's, got, it's gone over extremely well. So it kind of sells itself. People come in specifically for it and we've done very well with it. It's local, that excites people, and it's different. While exotic steaks and burgers spur sales, proponents also tout nutrition, citing the meat's leanness and omega-3 fatty acid content, which they say rivals that of fish. Bison is a, is a beautiful protein, so bison itself, um, as we know, is a lower, lower fat ratio than beef. Um, it has a higher iron content, and it is very delicate. No gamey flavor to it. Thanks, Dave. Klingelhofer attributes potential health benefits of bison consumption to his animal's simple grass diet, which excludes growth hormones and antibiotics. The difference in a pound of beef and a pound of bison is when you're done frying it, you still have a pound of bison. It's expensive up front, but you actually get what you pay for. Minimal supplements keep input costs down, but the buffalo man says time is a top hurdle. It takes three years to get bison to market, but similar ruminants like cattle are ready in less than half the time. It's a pretty slow process and kind of frustrating a little bit because there's no money coming in. You know, with the beef cattle, you can sell all your calves at one time and get a big check, where these things, it's more of uh, sell one or two at a time. Premiums, typically a third or more higher than beef, are the payoff. Consistent price helps lure customers willing to pay $12 to $16 per pound for bison cuts. However, the bison farm anticipates the extended shelf life of jerky will help provide the backbone they seek for their business. Upping their ability to provide a larger volume of merchandise has led to an arrangement with Tennessee-based tractor supply company that provides cured product to coastal and southern test markets. We've never packaged one ounce sticks of jerky before, but it's working well, and it, it was a challenge, and uh, it's a learning experience a little bit, but uh, it's fun. When it came time to find a processor, Wahoo Locker was a no-brainer. A small, well-known packer a couple of hours away, Wahoo Locker draws clientele from Nebraska and surrounding states. With a reputation for high quality meats among mainstream and niche producers, owner Charlie Emsweiler says variety, from the barnyard to wild game, sets Wahoo Locker apart from larger businesses, which handle only one type of animal. The process is similar to beef. The meat's leaner, therefore it's gonna be a, a lot leaner product and higher in protein and a very healthy, healthy snack compared to beef. Beef you can only get so lean and bison resembles deer in, in a sense of the leanness, so it makes very good jerky. In the hunt for ancillary markets, the rancher from Big Red Country aims to borrow from Native American ways by utilizing all parts of each beast. Old West entrepreneurs used buffalo hide to make leather, 
bones were ground for fertilizer, and manure was burned as a fuel source. In the absence of wood or coal, natives, and later settlers, used buffalo chips, or plains oak, to keep warm and cook meals over. And with abundant supply, Klingelhofer draws modern parallels to outdoor enthusiasts. It burns clean and hot and uh, gives off a nice smell. As opportunities arise and barriers break down, Watertown Bison Ranch will continue its multi-pronged approach to the marketplace. And while working to increase the size of his herd, Klingelhofer hopes this icon of America's past propels his business into the future. I think as long as we can have a quality product, uh, people get used to the prices, get used to the quality, I think they'll stay with us. I mean, that's going to be our job, is to make sure people are happy. If they're happy, they'll buy it. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Export sales, liquidation of short positions, and anticipation over elections in South America made for mixed grain markets. For the week, December wheat lost seven cents, and the nearby corn contract gained a nickel. Anticipation over the Argentine elections kept the soybean market flat, with the January bean contract gaining two cents. December meal bucked the trend, falling $5.80 per ton. In the softs, December cotton lost $1.64 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, December Class Three milk futures lost 27 cents. The livestock sector continues to be volatile this week. December cattle lost just under a dollar. January feeders dropped 90 cents, and the December lean hog contract gained 265. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index increased more than half a percent. December crude struggled to stay above $40, losing 35 cents per barrel. Comex Gold declined $4.50 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index gained 3.5 points to settle at 337.10. Here now to lend us their insight on these and other trends are two of our regular market analysts, Elaine Cub and Walt Hackney. Hi. Elaine and Walt, welcome back. Always a pleasure. We're excited to have you. We want to jump into this wheat market, Elaine. It has been a tough market to watch. Down seven cents on the week. U.S. dollar is stronger. Are we going to get any positive news in this market? Yeah, um, it's hard to say. You know, longer term, what sort of weather? When we talk about the strongest El Nino that has been recorded, maybe ever. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that internationally could come up with some sort of a weather surprise. But as far as domestic wheat markets, you know, the, the most recent November report showed our export situation. The projections are the lowest since 1972. So, no, there's not a lot of optimism for U.S. wheat right now. What have you heard on uh, winter wheat planting progress? How is the crop looking so far? Big storms rolling across the plains this week. Anybody getting nervous? No, I think that the general conditions for winter wheat are good. We don't want to have the flooding. We don't want to have excess moisture. You want to just have the crop be able to make it through the winter. So, so far, so good there. Advice for producers with the wheat in the field? Um, you know, as far as marketing goes, yes. uh, sit tight. There have been some interesting things. If you've got wheat in the bin, you've got um, soft wheat in particular, that market's a little bit interesting. In the, the protein scenario, there's actually sort of a shortage or an excitement for the milling quality low protein wheat. So there's actually a premium for the Chicago contract over Kansas City right now, which is about the only interesting thing that we can say for a market that otherwise is just dragging along here in the doldrums. All right. Well, let's jump into the corn market. Positive week. Up a nickel, Elaine Cub. Does this bode well for a uh, Thanksgiving rally? Um, not necessarily. Okay. No. I mean, I think the the maybe the futures are starting to pay attention to the fact, or the the overall market structure is paying attention to the the farmers' in, in non willingness to sell. We've definitely seen it in the basis. The nationwide basis on average is 20 under, which is very strong for this time of year. And individual bids, I mean, out in the Eastern Corn Belt, there's 25 over bids at pr processors. There are some very strong basis numbers because the farmers just don't want to be selling at this price level. So as we work into December, how high can these futures run? How high will they need to run to pull that corn out of the farmer's hands? 
Well, I'll tell you personally, going through December, I, I'm more worried about how low can they keep falling if the dollar continues to be strong. I'm not expecting to see any major market rally through the end of the year. Um, but once you get past that and once you get past the usual crush of, of January, early January selling, I think that the market could get another 40, 50 cents sort of a rally. But long, I mean, long term, this is just sort of the price, I think, that there's there's no shortage, obviously, of supply. There's probably no change in major demand patterns at this point. So I think we're going to be fairly range bound. Now, you mentioned your bigger concern was how low this can go. How low do you think it can go? I, like I'm. Up? Well, I guess my point is I just don't think that we've seen a bottom because we have the potential strength in the dollar, the potential for another for a rise in interest rates that could strengthen the dollar further. I mean, those are the kinds of things, um, fund rebalancing here at the end of the year, things like that that could still put some downward pressure on these grain prices. Now, we've talked a lot about the dollar, big effect in wheat, big effect in corn, big effect in hogs. Where do you see the dollar going in the short term? Let's talk about through December, as we contemplate, again, the idea of a federal uh, reserve interest rate hike. I think that the interest rate hike has been priced in. So we've reached this level. It's a unit list level, but 1.00. It, it made that sort of psychological jump this week, which is interesting. But I think that that has therefore priced in this interest rate rise. The only surprise will be if they don't raise the interest rates. And in that case, um, that would be bullish to grains if the dollar then fell. I don't know that that's going to happen, but that's the thing to be looking out for. Is there, once, should the Fed raise rates, then we're going to start pressing for another rate increase, one I would suppose. assume. Yes. Is this a cycle that's going to continue to build, face headwinds uh, for producers all year? It could, you know, and, and we have to look so far back in history, in my or at least in our careers. Early you know, 2000s. The, or the 80s when interest rate changes happened every month or every few months, but it's been so long since the interest rate or the Fed has been changing interest rates from one month to the next that it's really hard to know how the commodity markets will react to that kind of activity. With that risk out there, potentially, do producers need to be doing anything with their 16 crop today? Are you on the corn side especially? I think that they should be looking long and hard at selling the 16 crop at the same time that they sell the 15 crop or start selling some of it. I don't want to be too aggressive because we don't know what the weather situation will be. We've started to get a little bit dry here this fall, and if we had a La Nina, which is a possibility to develop later on, um, we could have a drought year. I mean, we don't know. So I wouldn't be real aggressive with 16 sales yet, but once we see a 40 or 50 cent rally in the spring, which is possible and seasonally expected, I would, I would normally be suggesting to make seasonal sales. Okay. Now, I want to go to our, uh, our good friends over at Twitter. These folks have tweeted to us at Market to Market. We encourage all of you to do the same. And this question came from Jared in Oklahoma. Since we're talking feed grains, and we have two of the world's greatest feed grain experts on hand, Jared in Oklahoma, Jared McDaniel, is curious, will sorghum milo export numbers match or beat the USDA estimate? And if so, will basis improve? And Elaine, I want this to go to you. So my understanding of China, and it's, this is a China story. China has been the one that has really been driving the excitement for sorghum in 2015. But going into 2016, the USDA is no longer projecting those exciting sort of export numbers. So if the sorghum basis, if that, this premium that we've been experiencing in 2015 falls back, that would not be a major bearish change. It would just be a reverting back to normal sort of situation. And I think that that's probably the most likely scenario for sorghum it might not go all the way back to normal because we do have increased uh, food grade you know, use for sorghum that we hadn't seen five years ago, let's say. But otherwise, and, and Walt can speak to this, typically sorghum, milo, and corn are basically the same value in a feed ration. I think your comment one to one is pretty accurate. I know as a, an ex-feedlot manager, I know that we looked at it in that regard to our Morrison feeds and feeding charts. And in regard to that, I would certainly agree with you that the only problem is, as we talked in our conversation, is in Milo, when you're flaking, if that's your goal at the feedlot, it gelatinizes much quicker than corn in the rollers. And you have an issue there that you have to be sensitive to, and you have to turn your heat down, and you got to re adjust your rollers and so forth. Now, well, in your conversations with cattle feeders, particularly in the in Kansas, Oklahoma, sorghum growing areas, are they eyeing these large sorghum acres as a relatively cheap 
feed source uh, for think, the remainder of 16? Excuse me, Mark. Yes, I think that you could easily say they always are looking for alternate sources of okay. grain that might help them in their ration costs. But there are overriding issues in regard. For instance, wheat. Uh, you, you should not apply over 41% of your ration as wheat in the ration, and you need to have then the balance of it in corn or so forth. You have the gelatinizing issue if you're a flaker with Milo, so there are those offsetting circumstances that you have to be careful. Not to say you can't use it if it's uh, financially to your advantage, but be careful if you're putting it in the ration. And if you get it too hot, if you will, too high in the protein, then all of a sudden you start ulcerating the livers. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden you start taking big discounts from the packer with ulcerated livers. Yeah, and this is not the time to be taking big discounts Absolutely from the Absolutely not. Now we want to come back and talk livestock, but first, Elena, I want to get your thoughts on the soybean market. As we look out this week, relatively flat, Argentinian election on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, is that going to have a big impact on the U.S. bean market on Monday? I hope not. I mean, it wouldn't okay. wouldn't logically make sense, especially because both of the candidates that are up for the presidency are, have both said that they intend to remove that the restrictions or the, the, the export taxes or whatever it is that has mm -hmm. been reducing the exports coming out of Argentina. Both of them have said that they want to do that. Now, the actual timing, are we really going to witness that happening very soon? Really hard to say, but when you look short term, this past week's export sales numbers for soybeans was reduced or was lower than we've been seeing lately. So maybe our export customers are looking out, you know, through 2016 anyway and saying, well, maybe we're going to turn to Argentina once we see this happen. Given that that's, again, another downside risk opportunity or potential, I should say, uh, do growers need to be aggressively marketing that 15 crop here before these kind of changes can take place? I, I wouldn't say that this is a threat of that level just because I believe our U.S. soybean prices live and die based on our domestic demand okay. more so than exports. Or, or we're not going to lose so many exports based on this factor alone that you need to be worrying about this on Monday. So if folks have beans in the bin, keep them there, what would be your strategy? You know, the, the, yes, probably, because they also would be seasonally expected to be rising in the spring. But if you need cash before the end of the year, beans are a better bet than corn just because you can raise cash faster with a bushel of soybeans than a bushel of corn. All right. Thank you so much, Elaine. Great answer. Now, Walt, I want to come over to you. We have seen uh, a lot of volatility in this in this live cattle market in particular. Big up days, big down days, finish the week down a dollar. What does that mean for the producer, the guy trying to use the board to hedge? How do you manage risk? I'm so glad you brought that to the table. Volatility is a new animal in the livestock industry, and it has created an environment in the average producer sector of his inability to arrive at a sensible price discovery in regard to the cash market. He can't do it. He has no sense of value in regard to the current cash market as a result. He can't accurately price his product even in a negotiating environment because this volatility is up the limit one day, down the limit the next, up the limit the next day, and it has taken away from him all the confidence of arriving at price discovery in the value of cattle specifically. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we are all aware of what's happened to the feeder market also. Yes. We went from in the high of a historically high feeder price in the midsummer of $2.50 or 60 cents on a six and a half weight feeder steer for October delivery. We're down under two bucks a hundred now. Do feed yards get in and buy at this price? Are we at a fear-based bottom here or do you expect things to go higher, or do you hold off, give it some more time, and let it continue to fall? They'll buy at the current market even though they have no real sense of price discovery in the value of the calf or yearling. Mm -hmm. The fact remains, though, if it's ridiculously priced lower, well, then again, yes, they'll buy and fly, if you will, by the seat of their britches, 
in regard to the break even and what the economic return on those is going to be 200 days down the road. Sure. And so as a result, you've got a real reluctance out here. There's been a phenomenal money drain in the cattle feeding industry specifically. Now we're seeing it in regard to the ranch community. They have loved the market and well, they should have. But now all of a sudden, those that retained the ownership of their calf crop, for instance, they're sitting out there on the point of a needle and they don't know what to do. They can't, they can't objectively keep them, put them on feed, take the gamble of feeding them out. They don't have the facilities or the where to wall for the grain supply and all. So they've got to look at the cash market. Okay. And that's true in the fed cattle market, too. They're, today, as an example, Mike, they're sitting here as we speak, getting bid a buck twenty three on cattle that um, a week ago were at least a dollar twenty nine to thirty one. Yeah. I mean, it's just phenomenal, the volatility. Oh. Yeah, a $9 range in a week uh -huh. is incredible. Now, before we let you go, Walt, we want to get your thoughts on the hog market. Up $2 this week. Do we find a bottom? Are we moving higher? I think it'd be really dangerous to be seeking a dollar or two as far as a bottom of the market goes. I don't know where it is, neither does anyone else. The analysts that I really respect and pay attention to are fearful that we're going to be able to accurately and adequately have a 2.3 million head hog slaughter weekly going into the first quarter of this coming year. They think we've got an expansion rate out there that's going to supply those hogs in those numbers. Okay. All right. And we will pick that up in the Market Plus and get into more details. Walt and Elaine Cub, thank you both so much for being with us this week. Yeah, you're very welcome. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Elaine, Walt, and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in that Market Plus segment, which you can find on our website. It's the place you'll find audio podcast and streaming video of the program. You can also interact with us through our Twitter and Facebook feeds. We are at Market to Market. And join us again next time when we'll examine a group of farmers who help people in need on the other side of the world. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by... Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.